بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول الإمام الترمذي رحمة الله عليه باب ما جاء في صفة إزار رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم The chapter of what tells us about the izar of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And the izar is the lower garment that the Arabs during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were accustomed to and they used to wear it. And it's from the clothes of their environment. It's from the clothes of their time. It's not acceptable for someone to come and to put on the community, on this ummah, the wearing of an izar claiming this is the sunnah this is the sunnah you should do this because it's the sunnah because there are no hadith no ayat where the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam told us that there are some special virtues in wearing the izar in an environment in which the people are not used to the izar it shouldn't be done so that people don't cause fitna to be put on the people unnecessarily, especially if he knows that by wearing that izar, it's going to cause some type of drama. Don't create drama in the environment that you're in unnecessarily. As for the one who wants to wear the izar because it is the clothing of his people in Yemen, they wear the izar, the longi. In Somalia, Ethiopia, Djibouti, in those places, they wear the izar. So because it's the clothing of the environment, of their people, of their culture, in this case, no problem, no problem. So we're going to deal with what has come to us from the authentic Sunni, inshallah, as it relates to the izar of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. First hadith, hadith number 119, is the hadith of our mother Aisha. Humayra bintu Siddiq radwanullahi alayhima. She... May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with her. When inside of the house, when there were a group of men, as the narrator of the hadith told us, Abu Burda, he said that, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. She went into the house and she brought out a kisa and she brought out also an izar that was very heavy, was very thick. And she said, in these two garments, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his ruh was taken by Allah, meaning he died in these two garments. So one of the garments that he wore and he was wearing was an izar that was a ghalid. It was heavy, it was coarse. And the other one was an upper portion, an upper top portion that had patches on it and it was stitched up. So the hadith is being brought here, and this hadith is in Salih Bukhari and Muslim as well. And Al Imam Al Tirmidhi brought this hadith in this book, Shama'il Al Muhammadiyah. So the hadith, no doubt, is authentic. That the Prophet died, alayhi salatu and he had an izar that was very coarse, 
It was heavy. It was tough. It wasn't expensive. It wasn't made out of the finest or the best material. And he had a kisat, something that covered up his upper portion. And it had patches on it and in it. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. So the hadith is pretty clear that it establishes that he wore the izar. As a matter of fact, he died in the izar that he was wearing. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. The next hadith, Al-Imam al-Tirmidhi brings his chain of narration. and He said that he was told by his sheikh, Mahmoud ibn Ghaylan, who said that he was told by his sheikh Abu Dawood on the authority of Shu'ba, on the authority of Al-Ash'ath ibn Sulaym, who said he heard his paternal auntie say on the authority of her paternal uncle, and her paternal uncle is not mentioned by name, he was left like that, what they call Mubham, it's not known. But he spoke and he said that one time I was walking in Al Medina and someone was behind me and I heard them say to me, Irfa Izarak, for innu atqa wa abqa. He said, I was walking in Medina and I heard a voice and someone said from behind me, Raise up your Izar. Because if you raise it up, it's going to have more taqwa in it if you raise it up. And it's going to last longer. He said, I looked behind me, and lo and behold, it was the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was Rasulullah. So when he told me that, I said, Ya Rasulullah, but the izad that I'm wearing, it is a burda malha. It's an izad that's not very expensive. It's not that expensive. It's not something that is very expensive. It's not that important. I don't pay a lot of attention to it. The Nabi said to him upon hearing that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Am I not an example for you? Am I not an example for you? The man said, Yes. He said, So I looked at the Izar of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it was halfway between his foot and his knee. It was halfway on his sock, on his shin. So this hadith of the Nabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. It's an important hadith from a number of angles. First one from the angle of the Isnad. The narrator of the hadith is not mentioned by name here. But anytime we hear of a hadith where a companion said, the Prophet did this, the Prophet did that, he said this, he said that, we don't have to know who that companion is. All of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Radiallahu Anhum Ajma'een are Udul All of them are Fiqat So in the chain of narration In the chain of narration One of the five conditions Is that each person has to be known And he has to be a good narrator But whenever you get a chain of narration In which the companion is not mentioned It said One of the companions said One of the companions reported one of the companions narrated, radiallahu anhum, we're going to accept that because all of them are udul, all of them are thiqat, because Allah wa ta'ala established that for them in the Quran and the Prophet established that for them in the Sunnah. Radiallahu anhum wa radu an. That's the tazkiyah of Allah azawajal for them. Allah is pleased with all of them and they're all pleased with Allah. So when he said that, sallallahu alayhi wa it establishes the adala and it establishes the thiqa of that particular companion, whether we know who he was or we don't know who he happened to be. So the particular uncle in this particular hadith is Ubaid ibn Khalid, Ubaid ibn Khalid radiallahu anhu. You get that from the many narrations, you come to know who was narrating this hadith. And he also was the paternal uncle of Burda, Rahimahullah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Concerning this hadith, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave advice to the man and he told the man, Irfa' izaraka, fa innahu atqa wa abqa. Raise up your izar because it was dragging. And the man didn't mean for it to drag. It's another example of a companion who wore an izar 
and his izar was dragging because the nature of the izar is usually you have to keep rolling it up. You have to keep rolling it up. When Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, heard the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man jarra izarahu khuyala la yandurullahu ilayhi yawmu qiyama. Anyone who drags his lower garment, his izar, and he's doing it out of arrogance, Allah won't speak to him yawmu qiyama. When Abu Bakr heard that, he said, Ya Rasulullah, inni at the ahadu izari. I'm always pulling it up and I'm always doing, pulling it up and it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. So sometimes it drags and I don't mean it. He said, you're not from the people who do it out of arrogance, Ya Abu Bakr. You're not one of the people who do it out of arrogance. So the way that their izars were, some of them will fall down and that's what happened with this particular man. When the Prophet saw it, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told him, lift it up because it has more taqwa and it is abqa. That kalam of the Nabi shows a number of issues. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shows number one, if anything was wrong in his presence, he had to say something about it in which he did. And he didn't allow a person's position, prestige, his money, his relationship to him or to anyone else prevent him from giving a da'wah to Allah and prevent him from giving nasiha. The Muslim is the one who he tries to give advice to people with what is most appropriate and what is best for that particular situation. Hadith also goes to show what the scholars have mentioned that Al-Islam came to protect five things, what they call the dururiyatul khamsa, the five necessities that are connected to the people's lives. Al-Islam came to maintain and to protect the dururiyat al-khamsa. And from the five things Islam came to protect, it came to protect our monies. Our monies. La ta'kulu amwalakum baynakum bil batil. Do not devour your monies between yourselves with what is wrong and falsehood. Riba is not permissible. Gambling is not permissible. If you've been made responsible for the wealth of an orphan or someone, you have to take care of the wealth of the orphan. It's a major sin to eat his wealth because you are devouring it with what is batil. That ayat is general. Do not engage each other in any commerce, in anything where you're taking someone's money unjustly. You're going to sell him a product that is faulty. Any of that, every, everything. So, in the issue of the fiqh of al-Islam, when we talk about the fiqh of a tijara, the fiqh of commerce, buying and trading, al-Islam came with many, many ayat, many, many ahadith telling us, fear Allah as it relates to the monies of the people. When you come to weigh-in, weigh lil al-mutaffifin. Woe unto those people of the mutaffifun, the one who is mutaffif is the one who, when he weighs for people, he shortchanges them. He weighs for himself, he makes more weight. The point is, when the Prophet told the man, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, raise your izar, it has more taqwa, and it will cause your izar to last longer. The meaning it's more taqwa is, the izar below the ankle bone is haram. So to raise it up, that is taqwa. And it will last longer. If you have a dragon on the floor, it's going to wear out quicker. It's going to wear out quicker. So we come to the issue of the izar or other than the izar. Ikhwatifillah. It's not permissible in the deen of Allah for the Muslim man. The Muslim man and not the Muslim woman. She's the opposite, ruling. It's not permissible for the Muslim man to wear anything on his lower extremity where it goes below his ankle bones. And this is a kabira from the kabair due to the many texts that came to us from the authentic sunnah. He says, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam thalathatun la yukallimuhum allahu yawmul qiyamati wa la yanzuru ilayhim wa la yuzakkihim wa lahum adabun alim Three people, Allah will not look at them yawmul qiyamah nor will Allah speak to them Yomul Qiyamah. And Allah will not purify them Yomul Qiyamah. And they have a serious punishment. 
they have an adab that is alim, it hurts. The very first one from those three, he mentions sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-musbil. Al-musbil is the individual who he's wearing his lower extremities, pants, thobe, izar, whatever he's wearing, and it goes below his ankles. Not permissible. It's a kabira from the kabair. And we know that something is a kabira from the kabair because, number one, there is a nas. The ayat or the hadith said, this is a kabira. We know it's a kabira from the kabair because of the had. If something is going to happen to you or you're punished, that's a major sin. And number three, and this is our case here, by the wasf, the description that was given to that thing. The one who is musbil, Allah won't speak to him. And people are going to want Allah to speak to him, Yomul Qiyamah. They want Allah to give them salams. They want Allah to say to them, Enter into the Jannah, Bima kuntum ta'maloon, because of what you used to do. They want to hear Allah speaking to them. He doesn't speak to them, He doesn't look at them, and He won't purify them. So, based upon this description, we know that Al Isbal is a major sin. The other two people in this, in this uh, particular hadith was the one who we call the Mannan. The Mannan. The Mannan is the individual who, when he does something for you, he always reminds you of what he did for you. He reproaches you and he says, You remember I did that for you? You remember I gave you that? Do you remember this? Do you remember that? And he does it just to have a hand up over the individual. If a person did it for a religious reason, then it's permissible. But it's very restricted. And then the third individual is the person who spends. And whenever he sells his salah, he's always saying, Wallahi, Wallahi, and he's lying. How much is this? He says, Wallahi, is 25 pounds. Wallahi, I bought it for 10 pounds, 15 pounds. And he knows he's lying. Those three people will fall into the major sin. So the hadith of Al-Isbal is clear. He mentions, Sallallahu alayhi Wa ala alihi wa sallam, Izratu al-Muslim, Izratu al-Muslimi, ila nisf al-sa' wa la haraj. Aw, la junah fi ma baynahu wa bayn al-ka'b, wa ma tahta al-ka'b fa huwa fi al-nar. The izar of the Muslim should be halfway to his sa', to his shin. And then there is no problem if he wants to go lower than that, or lower than that, or lower than that. But what is below the ankle bone is in the hellfire. So there are a number of a hadith in this regard. Menjarra izarahu batra lem yandirillahu ilayhi yomu qiyamah. Anyone who drags his vote is stole bataran, batr, with arrogance. Another hadith they say khuyala, also a form of arrogance. He won't be of those people who will enter into the Jannah. And Allah Azza wa will not look at him, won't speak to him, Yom al -Qiyam. And the reason for that is because the people who do in the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the signs of arrogance, of kibr, the rich people, is that they used to do this. They used to wear their clothes and they would drag their clothes as if to tell the society, look, I have the money to waste. I have the money to waste. So the isbal, as we mentioned a number of times, it's just not in a person's thobe. The isbal is also in the cum of his sleeve, in that the izar or the sleeve of the Nabi came to his wrist, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he didn't allow it to go far over his hand unnecessarily. That was the action of the people who were arrogant. The imama, some of the people during that time who were arrogant, they used to wear the imama, and the imama would be longer than what it needed to be, and it would drag. And sometimes it wouldn't drag, but it was very long to show, look at all of the money that I have. That's considered to be also a form of al-isbal. Don't waste and don't be a person who wants people to look at you, to say when they look at you, look at the money that he has and look at how he's wasting money. He's better than everybody else because he has the superfluous of whatever he's doing. And this is another reason he made it impermissible. Also, the scholars considered it to be a form of isbal, waste, to put a curtain over the wall in your house unnecessarily. Curtain over the window, no problem. 
but the curtain over the walls of the house, the Prophet ﷺ prohibited that. So all of the Muslim men, we have to wear clothes where we are not disobeying Allah in public, where people are seeing us. Your thobe, your pants, your izar, whatever you're wearing, it has to be above your ankle bone. Another issue, when it comes to the nikah, and the Muslim woman, she wants to wear the white dress and do what the non-Muslim people do. She's going to get a few women, her sisters, whoever, they're going to wear the same dresses. There's nothing inherently haram about that. She wants to wear this dress, wears that dress. But when she wears the dress that is long and is flowing, and then she has the bridesmaid, little girls, coming behind her, carrying her, her dress, that is a form of isbal with the women. Although, although, in the hadith of Umm Salama, radiallahu anha, when she heard, the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best place of the lower garment of the man, his pants, his izad, his thobe, the best place is halfway on his shin. Well, in Abba, if he doesn't want, he can make it lower. And he can make it lower, he can make it lower. But it has to be above the ankle bone. Um Salam said, but what about us women? If we were to make our clothes like that, our feet would show. He, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, allowed the women to wear their garments below their, their feet, below their shoes. So she asked, but Ya Rasulullah, sometimes we walk and we go, upon, we go past places, there's najasa there. There's some mud, water mixed with najasa. We don't know what, what's the ruling. He said, when you walk over that and your clothing goes over that, the dirt that's dry, the dirt after that purifies it as Allah Azza wa Jalla has made the earth a purifier in this deen. وَجُعِلَتْ لِيَ الْأَرْضِ مَسْجِدًا وَطَهُورًا the, the, the land, the earth, has been made for me and my community as a masjid. Pray wherever you want to pray in the earth. And it is a purifier. You can make tayammum off of the earth. You can use the dirt to make ruqya and to put it on your sores or your wounds or whatever you have. So here we have Ikhwani in the second hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He told the man, Khalid. He told the man, Ubayd ibn Khalid, pick up your thobe because it's more taqwa and it's also will cause your thobe to last longer. Something similar to this happened as Al Imam al Bukhari has collected and narrated. When Umar radiallahu anhu was assassinated and he was about to die, there was a young man who came to him to give him glad tidings that he was going to go to Jannah and he said, Abshir. Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. Glad tidings, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. Allah give you Bushra. Allah give you Bushra. Ayahs of the Quran were revealed on your behalf. And plus, in addition to that, you were a companion of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And you were one of the people that was in Islam for a long time. And also, you should be happy, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, because you took responsibility of the Muslims. You became the Khalifa. And the fact that you became the Khalifa is a virtue because the people who you became a Khalifa over, those people, may Allah be pleased with them, they were in agreement that you should be the Khalifa. So that's a tazkiyah. So, abshir. Not only that, not only that, but you took the Khilafa and you were fair and you were just. You had adal. So I give you glad tidings. Umar radiallahu anhu, he said to the boy, I wish that I was just equal in my deeds. That the things that I've done, they wouldn't be for me and they wouldn't be against me. Meaning, uh, I don't know. He didn't rely just upon the fact that he was Umar al Farooq, one of the best friends of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa He didn't rely on that. It was a proof and indication of his humility, and a sign that people today who are arrogant, anyone who is arrogant today, we shouldn't be arrogant at all, generally speaking, but the mutakabbir and mustakbir, why is he arrogant? Who is he anyway? Compared to Umar, who had all of that humility. So, before he died, 
The boy said those things to him and he said, I, I, I just wish I was equal. My deeds were equal. The boy got up and he left. When he left, Umar saw that he was musbil. He said to the people, tell him to come back. They said, the Amir Mu'min wants you. He came back. He told the young boy, Irfa thobak, fa'innahu atqa li rabbik wa abqa li thobik. The same kalam of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa He told him, lift up your thob. Don't let it drag the way I see a dragon. Because that's going to be more taqwa, because Allah commanded you to do that. And it's also going to cause your thob to last longer. The same kalam of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. We have to mention this, and we can't fail to mention it. Some of the people, especially people who were involved in politics, especially them, the regular Muslim from the awam, the regular Muslims from the ammat al nas, the regular Muslim who's just struggling, trying to be a religious person, trying to get to Jannah, you won't find them saying things like this many times. Ignorant people say this, and the polit political Muslims. They say things like, you know, when you people talk about the secondary issues in Al-Islam, like the miswak, the pointing of the finger, Al-Isbal, the lihya, the niqab, the jilbab, the hijab, when you people talk about these things and you engage the Muslims in these things, there are things that are bigger than that. These things are insignificant. These things are not that important. The Muslims are being killed. What about our land that's being taken? What about this? What about that? And no doubt, Khwani, uh, we mentioned many times that there is the fiqh of the awliyat. Some things are more important than others. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. But we shouldn't see anything in the deen of Allah as being insignificant because there's a prohibition about that. Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لا يحقرن أحدكم شيء من المعروف. None of you, if something is correct, it's معروف. Don't look at it as being insignificant, no matter what it is. It تقلنار ولو بشق تمر. Seek protection in Allah from the hellfire, even if it's with half of a date. When you greet your brother, smile at him, his face, because your smile is a sadaqa. When your wife cooks for you. That cooking is a sadaqah. When you have relationships with her, akramakumullah, that's a sadaqah. That you gave, a sadaqah that she gave. Everything in our deen. Everything. He said all of Benny Adam, they wake up in the morning, 360 joints on their body has to give a sadaqah. It's wajib. Then he went on to say, what is the comprehensive understanding of sadaqah in this religion? He said, Al Amr bin Maruf, Al Nayyan al Munkar is Sadaqah. Saying a kalima tayyiba, Sadaqah. You have to say that. Lifting something up to someone is a Sadaqah. So everything, everything in our religion, if it's from the deen of Allah, then it is significant. And we acknowledge and we recognize some things are more important than others. No doubt about that. But woe unto the people who want to minimize these aspects of Al-Islam that have an impact on the bigger things. There's a knock-on effect. There's a knock-on effect. If a person is looking at things as being insignificant, then you can rest assured when it comes to the bigger aspects of Islam, like his salat and things like that, it's going to have an effect on the way he views those particular issues as well. The fact that Umar was stabbed and Umar was dying and yet he took the time out. And the Prophet ﷺ praised Umar for his deen, praised him for his knowledge. He saw that it was important enough to say to the boy in this situation, Hey, lift up your thobe because that's more taqwa to Allah. He told you to do that. And it will cause your thobe to also last a long time. So the point that we're trying to make right here is pretty clear, inshallah, and that is, the importance of a nasiha and a da'wah Allah and being careful of being the people who minimize aspects of the religion. They call them the qashur, the qashur, the, um, the peelings. You know, the banana, when you take the banana peel off and you throw that 
They call that the koshur, the apple. You take a knife and you take the skin off. Those are the koshur, the orange. You peel it away. You throw it away. These people call this issue of isbal. They call it koshur, leaving your beard. It's just a few hairs, koshur. Anas ibn Umadik told the people during this time, you people, you're doing crimes, mistakes, you're doing mistakes. They are lighter in your eyes than a strand of hair. During the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi we used to consider these same actions as the actions that will destroy you. So yep, it's a piece of hair. But the Prophet cursed the lady who took off of her, her eyebrows. And he's not going to curse a lady for something small like that. He's not going to curse her for something small. And the other thing is about the qashur. To say that about any aspect of the religion is from the actions of the munafiqeen who used to talk about religion, the deen in that way. They would hear the adhan and they would make games and make faces when the adhan would go off. This is from the qashur. This is just a game. This is this, this is that. And as it relates to the banana itself, is the banana protected with anything other than the pill of the, of the banana? No, Allah protects the banana with the pill. Is the apple protected with anything other than the pill of the apple and the orange the same way? That's our deen. You pull off those so-called kashur and you throw them away and you make them as if they're insignificant. That which is bigger, that thing which is bigger, that thing is going to be affected. It's going to have a knock-on effect. So we don't want to be of these people because the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they were not of those people. We come to the third hadith of this chapter and there are four hadith in the chapter and that is the hadith of Iyas ibn Salam ibn Aqwa and the authority of his father Salama ibn Aqwa one of the tremendous companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that Uthman ibn Affan, he used to wear his izar halfway to his sock. And when the people saw him wearing his izar halfway to his sock, Uthman ibn Affan said, this is where the izar of my sahib used to be, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala Alaihi Wasallam. Meaning the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam taslim in kathira. These hadith that went forth, with the exception of the first hadith, they have some problems. They have some problems. One of the hadith they have a narrator in the hadith, Abdullah ibn Lahia. He's one of those important narrators, student of knowledge you know about. It's a bit of a problem. He had ikhtilat. As time went on, his memory was compromised and that's the sunnah of Allah today if you were to say Sheikh so and so I think he has ikhtilat people will get upset with you and tell you you're against the sunnah you're against the ulama the great scholars of Islam it used to happen to him that's the sunnah of Allah he created you you didn't know anything and then as time went on you started to learn things and then you started to regress and digress in your knowledge and you became senile even. That happened to some scholars. The ulama of Islam, they know precision, with precision, who this happened to. So they would say his narrations before this time were good. His narrations after this time, no good. So this particular man is in the chain of narrations. Abdullah ibn Lahia. I'm bringing him to your attention because again, Ikhwani, for those of you who are the students like the... Um, the cream of the crop students in our daros, this guy, this man, this narrator, you got to know him. Abdullah ibn Lahia. He is maqbul, his hadith problems, problems. But if he narrates on the abadala, the abadala, then his hadith is accepted. If he narrates on the abadala, and that's why I'm bringing this to your attention, because we told you about the abadala from the companions. It's not talking about those abadala. Ibn Lahia, if he narrates on the three men who have the name Abdullah and they're not from the companions, then his narration is good. His narration on Imam Abdullah bin Mubarak, 
no problem. You see him narrating on him, no problem. Abdullah ibn Wahab, no problem. Abdullah ibn Mukri, no problem. If he narrated on Qutayb ibn Sa'id, no problem. But his narrations on other people, they're problems. But the narrations that we have, other narrations strengthen them. So what we took so far has been authentic. Because his hadith by itself is a problem. But there are other hadith that strengthen it. Now, as it relates to the issue of the hadith of Uthman, Ridwanullahi Ali, has some issues in it. But again, as we mentioned, it's strengthened with the other narrations that we mentioned. So Uthman, just as the man before him, when the Prophet said to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do you not have in me a perfect example? لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَيَوْمُ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا You have in him a perfect example for the one who is hoping to mean Allah. And he also, he believes in يوم القيامة and he remembers Allah a lot. Yes, the answer is, he is a good example. So Uthman, رضي الله عنه, was following the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Last hadith in this chapter, Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi brought his chain of narration. His shaykh Qutayb ibn Sa'id said that he was told by Abu Al-Ahwas. He said, I'm the authority of Abu Ishaq, who is a problem in narration. Weak, weak. He said, I'm the authority of Muslim ibn Nadir, who is also weak in narration. This man, he said that, Hudayf ibn al-Yaman said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam took the back of his calf muscle. He took the back of his calf muscle. And he said that this is the place of your izar. This is where your izar should come. But if you don't want it to be this high, then you could go a little lower. And then if you don't want it to be that high, you can go a little lower. And there's no blame on you for what is above the ankle bone. For what is above the ankle bone. So this hadith and this chapter, it goes to show that the izar was the clothing that the Prophet used to wear, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from the low extremities. It covers up the low extremities. And all of the clothes of the Muslim, as it relates to the low extremity, it should not go below the ankle bone. Whether he's doing it in arrogance or he's not doing it in arrogance. Abu Bakr didn't do it in arrogance. The other companion that we mentioned, he didn't do it in arrogance. But the Prophet said, don't you have in me a good example? Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. And then we have the general hadith that doesn't mention arrogance at all. Ma kana taht al-ka'bain fahuwa finnar. Whatever is below the ankle bone is in the hellfire. He didn't mention arrogance or without arrogance. Just a general karam. Similar to that hadith. It's not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah on the last day to travel for three days without a mahram. Okay, what about two days and one day? Can she travel without a mahram? Well, there's a hadith that's general. He didn't mention three days. It's not permissible for any woman who believes in Allah on the last day to travel without a mahram. So when he didn't make the taqeed, the tahdeed, he didn't make a um, condition. He didn't make any of that. It's not for us to come and say only with arrogance. If you don't do it with arrogance, then it is something that is okay. Before moving to the next chapter, inshallah, I want to bring this to your attention in the Muslim world, in the Arab world. You will find in the Arab world people laughing at the so-called religious people who, if his thobe is halfway to the south, and this is not something common in the Arab world. So even in the Arab world, Mecca and Medina, a student of knowledge, a Muslim has to look at the environment. Got to look at the environment. The regular people are not wearing that. You have to take that into consideration. Look at what the Ramah are doing. Look at what the scholars are saying. And don't you do something that's going to cause you to stand out in a way where your niyyah is going to be questioned. If a person is really sincere and he wants to spread this particular sunnah and he feels that the people that he's dealing with are going to be tolerant of him, they're going to understand. No problem. It's a good thing. We're not going to be afraid of spreading the sunnah because the people don't know about it. They don't like it. But we're going to spread the sunnah in a way 
where the people won't oppose the Sunnah because of their ignorance. In the Arab world, the people used to laugh at some of the Muslims and students if they saw you and they you had your fob halfway to your sock, they would laugh at you and make istihza. And that's kufr. قُلْ أَبِ اللَّهِ وَآيَاتِي قُلْ أَبِ اللَّهِ وَآيَاتِي وَرَسُولِي كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَهْزِئُونَ لَا تَعْتَذِرُ قَدْ كَفَرْتُمْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ It's kufr to laugh at something in the religion, to joke at the beard, anything from the religion. Kufrun billahi. A person can go outside of the religion. He's committing a crime of kufr. It turned out that in hip-hop, hip-hop culture, especially out of Philadelphia, Philadelphia in America, the non-Muslim men started wearing beards. Non-Muslim men started wearing their trousers halfway to their sock. They started doing that in America right now. Some of the hip-hop people got beards. And also, they two years ago, three years ago, they started that. They wear their jeans halfway up the sock in Mecca, in Medina, in Arabia, in Kuwait, in these other Arab places in the Arab world. The Shabab of the Arabs started wearing this stuff because the Kuffar were doing it. Yesterday they were making fun at it, and it's the Sunnah of the Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and now it became something that the Kuffar were doing, so they started to do it. It's a mushkira, it's a mushkira. And then from there, they came up with another thing, and that is to wear your jeans, and you have rips in your jeans, holes in your jeans. Your jeans go below your shoe and you could drag them on the floor. It's just, uh, just a crazy hippie look. I don't know what they call it. I don't know what they call it. So now that's the new thing. What the Kuffar do, our Shabab do it. What the Prophet did, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, people from our Ummah, they make istihzad. And they laugh at that particular thing. So as the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the signs of Yom Al-Qiyam is that Things are going to be haysa baysa, topsy turvy. Sunnah is going to become bidah. Bidah is going to become the sunnah. What people should love, they'll hate. What people should hate, they'll start to love. They'll leave his sunnah and take the sunnah of the people of kufr. We ask Allah Azza wa to give hidayah to us, hidayah to you, hidayah to all of our shabab. We go to the second chapter, Khwani, pretty short chapter with three hadith. The chapter that Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi said, Rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatan wasi'a bab ma ja'a fi mishyati Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The chapter of how the Prophet used to walk sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. In the first hadith, in the first hadith, the uh, hadith is telling us on the authority of Abu Hurara radiallahu anhu he said, I didn't see anything. La ra'aytu shay'an ahsana min Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I didn't see anything better than the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it was as if the sun was in his face because his face would be illuminated. His beauty, his handsome nature, the nur that was emanating from his face sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, I never saw anyone who walked faster than the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. It was as if the earth would fold itself up to come up to meet him. And we, the companions, we used to struggle to try to keep up with him when we would walk with him. And his walking was a walking of a person who has something to do. He has somewhere to go, he has somewhere to be. His walking was not the walking of a person who is lazy or a person who doesn't have anything to do. His walking was a walking of power, huwa, and al isra. He used to be quick. Now, some people naturally have been created, doesn't walk fast. He doesn't walk fast. It's not for you to come and grab him and say, come on, we got to walk fast. Rasulullah used to walk fast. He doesn't have to do that. I don't want to walk fast. I don't like walking fast. That's not my way of walking fast. And we understand that the companions, they didn't walk fast. They will find it difficult to keep up with him, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. No hadith told them, keep up with me. No hadith said, if you keep up with me, this is a virtue, that's a virtue. 
Now, if you don't walk fast, but you want to inculcate that in your life because Rasulullah used to walk fast, no problem with that. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. But to say it's the sunnah, naam, it's the sunnah, meaning the sunnah that the muhaddithin said, what the Prophet did and what he said. So he did that. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Pay attention to what Abu Hurairah said, Ikhwani. Abu Hurairah, he saw a lot of things. When you look at the Arabic language, and this is really important, brothers, for all of us to know the importance of studying Arabic language. It's the language of the Quran. It's the language of this deen. And those companions, like Rasulullah, they were pure Arabs, and their language was not contaminated. Probably if the companions were present during our time, some of them would probably look at the way Arabs are speaking Arabic in a way where the person's adala is going to be taken down. Because the way the Arabs speak the language today is not what the companions were upon. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiallahu anhu ala kulli. Abu Huraira said, Ma ra'aytu shay'an ahsana min Rasulillah. I never saw anything that looked better than him. No shams, no qamar, no sama. No bird, no gazelle, no other man. I never saw anyone who was ahsan minhu. So Allah Azza wa sent someone who was perfect in his akhlaq, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he was perfect in his physical prowess. So that no one could come and say, hey, your arm is missing. Hey, your head is big. Hey, your ears are big. The way the people are today, they will criticize people for the way Allah created them. Except the people who have a taqwa. People who have taqwa, they don't care. Allah created them like that. But the prophets and the messengers, they were sent to people. Some of them didn't have taqwa. And they would use these things to say, we're not listening to you. Because you're to this or you're to that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a perfect specimen. Perfect, handsome, moderate in everything. Not very tall, not very short, extraordinarily strong. Everything on his body fit, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, and nothing was out of place. Nothing would cause someone to look twice to say oh, there's a problem. It's abnormal. No, he was as normal as they come, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, easy on the eyes. And this was a statement of, Abu Huraira showing you the love that he had for the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. And that hadith has Abdullah ibn Lahia in it, has Abdullah ibn Lahia in it, and it is as I told you brothers before. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought a book, and that book and his sunnah tells us the fiqh of walking. There's a walking that is permissible and there's a walking that's not permissible. Luqman told his son, Waqsit fi mishyik. He said, Oh, my son, when you walk, walk in a moderate way. Don't walk with arrogance and don't walk munkasar al dhahar. Don't walk where someone will look at you and say that they can take you, they can fight you, they can harm you. Don't walk like that, thinking that's piety. Umar used to hold people accountable for that. We tell people, don't walk in this way. Do you want the non-Muslims to think that we're weak? Walk in a way in which when people look at you, they see, okay, this person looks like, okay, he has some athleticism to him. He has some manliness to him. But also, don't walk in an arrogant way. He said, there was a man who was walking with a new thobe, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The man was walking with a new thobe. And his hair was combed real nice. And he had nice perfume on. And he was walking with what they call today swag. Swag. That guy got swag. Now if him having swag means he's assured of himself. And he's not afraid. Okay, the usage of that term, no problem. This is what the people are saying. The meaning of that term. And the understanding of the people. And their vernacular, no problem. But if swag means... He's walking in a way that is arrogant, then this impermissible. Rasulullah described that man. He said that the earth opened it up, opened up and swallowed that man up. 
and he will continue to walk like that, being punished until Yomu Piyama. So that type of walk in an arrogant way, look at me, look what I have, with your chest puffed out, something that's impermissible. We bring that to the attention of some of the brothers who are weightlifters, brothers who are weightlifters, brothers who are into mixed martial arts and things like that. If you lift weights and you come into the medjulis, you may naturally put your chest out to show people, look at my muscles, look at my chest and stuff like that. There's something that is against the deen, something that shouldn't be done. So this chapter is relevant to the lives of many people. The walking of the woman. He told us about the women from Beni Israel. Two of them were tall and the one in the middle was short. So she took some wooden shoes to raise herself up and they used to walk in front of men in a seductive way. And they would move themselves in a way to get the men to look at them. That walking is not permissible. Can the Muslim woman become a model and get on the catwalk and walk just in front of women? Not men, just in front of women. And she walks the way that they teach those women to walk? Not permissible. Not permissible. There's a prohibition of walking in a seductive way, in an arrogant way. And the opposite of that. We shouldn't walk in a way where we're inviting people to come and uh, take advantage of me. The man was walking like some of the Sufi people. People that are so woof. They tell you be a Zahid. Zahid. Abid. Abid. Don't worry about the dunya. And the person wants to show his humility. Not all Sufi people are like that. But this is one of the things that they were saying. Is a zuhud. Umar radiallahu anhu. When he saw that man he hit him on his back. Say what are you doing? What are you doing? Don't walk like that. You want these people to think that we the Muslims are weak. They're going to bother you. But don't walk in an arrogant way as well. Second hadith, and it is the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib. May Allah be pleased with him. If he described the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would describe him. And he said that when he used to walk, he used to walk in a way as if he was walking from an elevated place. That he would bend forward and he was walking as if he was walking from an elevated place. So if you're walking and the ground is elevated, you're going to walk faster. This hadith, we already took it. It's hadith number seven. In the chapter of the Prophet's creation, his khawq, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ali ibn Abi Talib described how his body was, described his hair, his shoulder, his ears, where his hair went. And we dealt with that hadith. It was hadith number seven in chapter Khalq, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for la nu'eed. We won't repeat it because we already did it. Last hadith, Ikhwani, Al Imam at Tirmidhi, he said that his Shaykh Sufyan ibn Waqir said that he was told by his Shaykh, who was his father, on the authority of Al Mas'udi on the authority of Uthman ibn Muslim ibn Hurmuz, who said that Naf ibn Jubair ibn Mut'im, he said that Ali ibn Abi Talib said that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to walk and he used to walk vigorously in a strong way as if he was walking from an elevated place. So the meaning of the hadith is he did not drag his feet when he used to walk. He didn't drag his feet. Some people walk with their shoes and they drag their feet as if they don't have anywhere to go. I don't say that that walking is haram. Don't say that it's haram. But he didn't walk like that. He used to pick his feet up and he used to walk in a vigorous way. So this last hadith, it supports the second hadith. So those are the two hadith, ikhwani, from the shama'il of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. That al-imam al-tirmidhi brought for us. So if you brothers have any questions about those two babs, you can feel free to put your question for it. If the canon the kum shaykh. Yes, Sheikh. Um, Normally, but when they're praying, they do it 
Concerning the issue of al-isbal, al-isbal, there are a number of hadith that prohibit al-isbal in the prayer specifically. There's a lot of kalam, is the hadith authentic, not authentic. One hadith, the Prophet told a man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, repeat your prayer to make wudu again. There's some kalam, and Imam al-Dhahabi brings that hadith in his book, Kitab al-Kaba'ir. There's another hadith that says, Allah doesn't look at the prayer of a person who prays and he's musbil. And the hadith is authentic, inshallah, as we jal. So there's a prohibition to pray while you're in the state of being musbil. And what was collected by Imam Muslim, one of the companions, he said that the Prophet wasallam prohibited us from praying musbil. So rolling up the clothes is the solution that some people have to that. But there's another prohibition that you shouldn't roll up your clothes while you're in salah. You shouldn't pray with your sleeves rolled up and you shouldn't pray with your lower extremities rolled up. So if a person comes to pray and he makes a tashmir, rolls up his garment, he's escaping one Prohibition, praying with Isbal, but he's fallen into another prohibition, which is the prohibition of praying and your clothes are mushammara. Your clothes are mushammara at tashmir. It's not permissible. So he just has to cut his stuff right away and just leave him at that particular place and just find it okay with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even if he's a professional, no one's going to bother you. No one's going to say anything. And it's not okay for us to be mutahawinun, mutakasirun in this issue, to be just nonchalant about it. We should try our best, try our best to uh, not be people who have isba. It's a kabir from the kabair. Another issue, lekhwani, about al isba, that is, some of us look at people who are not practicing, or they appear not to be practicing, and we may be judgmental. And I think that's something we should avoid because. Everybody is doing something or some things, except that Allah just protected them and gave them, you know, divine protection. But he is a person who's musbil, but he's being judgmental as it relates to that guy who's smoking cigarettes, or that other guy over there who's drinking khamr, or that lady who's not wearing uh, hijab. Okay, but you're also doing something. So don't be judgmental. Hate what you're seeing. Give dawah and advice and stuff like that. But don't be judgmental and say, look what I'm doing. Because everybody, everybody, we're doing things we shouldn't be doing. And um, also, we are doing things that, um, we're not doing things that we should be doing. May Allah Azza wa give us tawfiq, inshallah. Someone added, Tfadl ya akhi, Tfadl. Is it okay to tuck your trousers, your socks, if, it, if the trousers are longer than the ankle? Yeah, if the person tucks his trousers into his socks and therefore the trousers, they are above the ankle bone, inshallah, he um, will be okay. Inshallah, he'll be okay. But why make this a tahayul? Why make this a tahayul? The tahayul of the al Kitab, the Yahud specifically, who threw their nets out on Friday. And the nets were catching the fish on Saturday, the Sabbath, the Sept. And they came Sunday and they pulled in the fish and said, we were not fishing. Technically, we were not fishing. We didn't do anything Saturday. But they weren't supposed to throw the nets out at all on Saturday. You can fish on Friday, fish on Sunday. Saturday is the Sept. Rest. Don't do anything. They said, okay, we're not going to do anything. We just throw the thing out. And they catches the fish all day Saturday. We come Sunday and we reel it in and we say, we wasn't fishing. We're not fishing at the high. So why stick the thing in and you're on that maybe, maybe not. Just let the person just cut them, fix them up, trim them, uh, and, and sew them, hem them, and khalas. He did what was upon him. Anything else, Ikhwani? Fadli Yahi Adwi, Nur al-Din.
just from there to live it, but it's bad that today people have that, you know, that argument because it's the it's the new south, so we you know we're good and people don't have that they're bad. So people are like you know they're convinced for that. So how other person is like convinced, you know, he has to do that and show what he's doing. There are some scholars in Al Islam who took the position that if you are Musbil without being arrogant, then it doesn't apply to you. So the Amana Al Ilmiya dictates that we have to say that. And there are some scholars who took that position. There are some scholars who took the position that if you cut your beard, shave your beard, then you're not sinning. Some scholars took that position. There are some scholars who took different positions, like you can drink khamr. As long as you don't get drunk, you can drink khamr. So when those ulama wrote books about how to be a student of knowledge, al-imam al-khatib, al-baghdadi, adab, al-sami' wa akhlaq al-rawi, when they wrote those books, al-imam al-khatib, al-baghdadi, kitab al-faqih, wal-mutafaqih, how to be a faqih and a person who's trying to get fiqh in the religion. Those scholars wrote a lot of books like that. Ibn Rajab, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he wrote a book called Kitab Fadl al Ilm, The Virtues of Knowledge. All of them bring this chapter about beware of, avoid the rukhs of the ulama and the zalat of the ulama. Watch out for this chapter of some scholars said that, some scholars said that. Because if you go after that stuff, you can create a religion, a new religion. Because you'll find some scholars said that you could do muta marriage, bona fide good scholars. Some scholars said you can have relationships with the lady in the wrong place. Some scholars said you can divorce your wife. She's divorced, divorced and have relationships with her with the need of not taking her back. Some scholars said that. Some ulama of al-Islam said that. So can you imagine if uh, we went today, inshallah, and we all left the masjid after Salat al-Isha, and we went and we brought some uh, khamar or something like that, and we started drinking the khamar and said, but an imam so-and-so said it's okay. And he really said that. He said, as long as you don't get drunk, you can drink it. Another one said, well, if it's made out of grapes and dates, it's not khamr. But if it's made out of barley, if it's made out of, then it's khamr. No, we have to stay away from those mistakes of those scholars. But if a person really, 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 really believed, really, in the inner recesses of his heart, he really believed, and he did his best to study, and he wasn't following his desires, and he really believed that, and I believe that what we should do is we should uh, be easy and not be too rough, not be too tough. Because that is an opinion that some of the people took, although it's the opinion that seems to be marujuh. And Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, is a'la and a'la. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi wa ashabi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.